So I'm gonna share with you the story of one of the last cases I did before rabbinic school. So Steve, let's go. So most of you all know about the 5-4 Supreme Court case that declared George Bush president by prohibiting Florida officials from recounting ballots if the little chad on the punch card wasn't pushed, punched all the way through. But there's another less known part to the story. 16 years ago, I was a criminal defense attorney in Tallahassee, Florida, where much of this played out. Tallahassee went from a small university town, go Seminoles, to a media circus with satellite trucks on every corner and nary a hotel room to be found anywhere in the city. A group of voters from Martin County, Florida, approached me claiming massive voter fraud in their county, saying that thousands of Republican votes were illegally cast. I quickly set up a team of 10 lawyers from around the US to challenge these votes in court, which was totally separate from what became known as the more famous Hanging Chad case. So here's what happened. Hoping to benefit his brother, Florida Governor Jeb Bush expanded va absentee ballot, ballot laws in Florida to allow the elderly to vote without having to schlep to the polls. But to prevent fraud, the new law strictly required that an absentee ballot request form must dot all the I's and cross all the T's. The Republican Party then prepared pre-filled in absentee ballot request forms and mailed them to thousands of elderly Republicans in Mount Martin County with a cover letter from the governor that explained they could simply sign the form, mail it in the enclosed stamped envelope, and they'll receive an absentee ballot in time to vote in the election. But the software that produced the filled in forms had a bug. And the forms contained many errors, like wrong addresses, wrong voter IDs, and social security numbers. Not catching the errors, many elderly voters signed the form, certifying that the information was true and correct, and mailed them to Martin County Election Supervisor Peggy Robbins. As you'd expect, the supervisor's office easily caught the errors and placed the 1,000-plus cards in a dead file, along with an unknown number of other forms and cards from Democrats and Republicans who had made routine mistakes on their absentee ballot applications. Now here's where it gets interesting. Republican election supervisor Robbins, who we just saw, contacted local Republican party chair Tom Houck and allowed him to, to take the entire dead file, which were official government records, to Republican headquarters, where his staff spent all night manually editing the already signed under oath forms. The altered forms were returned the next morning, no inventory was kept of the removed forms, and those returned did not include any from Democrats. Altering the Republican apl applications meant that the Republican voters received over 1,200 illegally cast, uh, issued ballots, which were then all cast by mail. So we argued that the Republican election supervisor and local party chief committed clear criminal conduct by altering official records and by issuing ballots based upon the altered records. Expert statisticians testified that without those ball ballots, Al Gore had won the election in Florida. I rhetorically asked the judge, what if a bus of Democratic voters headed to the polls broke down, arriving just after poll closing, but the Democratic supervisor of elections reopened the then closed, already closed polls to allow her fellow Democrats to vote? We said election officials can't break the law, law to favor voters of their party. Bush's attorney, my friend Barry Richard, an occasional tennis partner, agreed that the ballots were illegally issued, but he said that the votes ultimately cast expressed the intent of those voters and that voter intent ought to prevail over technical errors, even if the errors arose from illegality and fraud. As the trial ended, I was deluged with cameras and reporters, but first I had to answer my ringing cell phone. It was my mother. She excitedly told me how so proud she was to have seen me on TV with all of her friends. I asked whether she liked my closing, lawyer's shorthand for a closing arguments. Thinking I said clothing, she said, oh yes, it was that brown suit, wasn't it? <laughs> we left the courtroom feeling good because we thought we had the Republicans in a box. If, we're, if following election law was more important than voter intent, we should win my case. But if the court said voter intent was more important, we would win the Hanging Chad case. If we won either case, Gore would win the election. A couple of days later, my law school classmate, Judge Terry Lewis, 
ruled that numerous felonies had in fact been committed in altering the forms and issuing the absentee ballots, but he also ruled that voter intent trumps all. So we lost, and the Republican ballots counted. As to the missing Democratic ballots, nobody could prove what happened to them or how many there were, so it did, didn't matter in the end. Both my case and the Hanging Chad case went to the Florida Supreme Court, which said that voter intent always prevails. That meant we won the Hanging Chad case and those ballots had to be counted, but we lost our case and the illegally issued ballots also would be counted. We thought that our strategy worked because once the Hanging Chads were counted, Gore would win the election. But to everyone's shock, the United States Supreme Court intervened in the Hanging Chads case, but not ours. In a 5-4 decision, the court ruled that the Florida Supreme Court's order to count the hanging chads was arbitrary and they prohibited the count. The five Republican justices declared Bush president. In his dissenting opinion, Justice John Paul Stevens, an appointee of Republican Gerald Ford, proclaimed that, quote, one thing is certain, although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It's the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. During these three weeks, my life was on hold. The local judges were aware of the situation, so they graciously postponed my routine cases. When I returned, one local judge asked me why a criminal defense lawyer was doing election law. I explained that it wasn't really election law, but theft. I still have that tie. <laughs> I must admit, the Bush lawyers were not all that combative, as if they knew the outcome all along. When it was over, they lovingly added my name to the mailing lists of Texas bootmakers and makers of Texas hot sauces and barbecue sauces. For several years, each time I got my mail from the overflowing mailbox, I wondered how the world might be different if I had won that case. <laughs>